So Doug here is, as I mentioned earlier, he is the current director of the Regional Materials and Manufacturing Network. So if you have a question to Doug on how he sees the, uh, uh, or maybe you want to ask him, um, what does RM2N uh, do? What, what is it about or how it's going to work with AMM? Uh, that will be the question to Doug. Danny represents WEDC. If you have question on WEDC role, and we have addressed that a little bit. Uh, Brian, uh, the president of the EWM Research Foundation. If you have questions related to IPs, then I will direct it to Brian. And um, Sheku is the uh, dean of the uh, uh, Applied Research at Milwaukee School of Engineering. And you might want to know how would Milwaukee uh, MSOE fit in this AMM, especially in the area, for, or for example, not special, for example, in the area of additive manufacturing. And uh, Joe here from uh, Rexnord, um, they, he has uh, a lot of experience working with industry, university industry consortia, that he, he was actually one of the uh, early uh, critics of the concept. So I was thinking, what? Yes. The first visit I went to Rexnord, it's like he read every, I, I don't know, I sent him brochures maybe like 15 pages. He had them marked. He was sitting in front of me and everything was marked. And then he would ask, turning to page three, third paragraph, you have this. Turning to page seven. And I felt like I'm back, you know, in, in I don't know, in, in, in uh, uh, grade school. And I'm being called to the, Sorry to put you on the spot. We have not rehearsed it. That's, yeah, truly, <laughs> I came, then I came back and I was thinking, oh, I mean, the, the questions that you asked had me to go back, see, sent me maybe like two months back in my thinking and the work I had to do. I remember one question you asked me about scaling up, which had, we had to go, I had to go back to the team and said, look, we're not talking about scaling up. This is what he asked me about. Then I kept repeating about uh, telling, you know, story about my experience there at Rexnord, because we met there at Rexnord. I said, you know, it was a, 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 a really intense, um, you did not know that, and probably did well in hiding that, but it was really intense, because it was very, like you asked questions, because of your experience, you knew what to ask. I have to say that I did not have the answers ready, uh, but um, <clears throat> it was there. And I, I did, I, 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 uh, you had me come back and, okay, we need to shape this better. So uh, with that, that's how I chose our panelists for the day. And I think they can cover these, uh, um, these from different angles. So back to you. Questions? And we probably need to take the mic back to you. And if you're not in the mood of talking. Oh, I can speak loud. Mm -hmm. Doug, so how do you see So the, um, the way I see it fitting is basically we already have um, the network of expertise and the equipment, all of that already um, inventory. So we have a website, wiskmat.org, that has all of the resources already there. Um, so if sort of we, I envi my envision of it anyways, is that we would become part of AMM, bring those resources to um, AMM, and then what we get out of it is, I mean, what we're trying to do is work with industry. And um, mostly, as uh, Nadal had mentioned, sort of on the fee-for-service consulting type. And so that opens the door for us to even more industry. I mean, we've been at this four years. The um, RM2N has been around four years. Um, and we're still you know, at the table, for example, talking about things. And clearly, no one's heard of it before. And so it's, we're trying to get the word out that these resources are available. I think AMM helps us to do that. So are there any of the Wisconsin universities Yes. Yeah, so right now we're at 11 of the 13 campuses. This question is for Joe. Uh, Joe, and I, I actually know Joe very well. We worked together uh, before. Uh, so you are absolutely right. He's a gentleman and a scholar, so that is very true. Uh, nothing less knowing Joe to go put you through that. Joe, you and I worked on a project uh, similar a joint project from an industry academia perspective, and you helped uh, push it along very, very successfully with the government. How do you think 
think AMM parallels that or does it parallel that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Sundari. And you know, what I would speak to a little bit is to echo some of Chitel's comments from earlier this morning. You know, what what AMM could afford us is the opportunity to uh, not just have those sort of one-off projects uh, where, where indeed we were successful, but give us access to a, a broader spectrum of um, call them uh, expanded technical capacity that, that we can tap into. Uh, that only works if that strong partnership is in place or, or mentorship to she tells comment uh, that helps kind of bridge the the academic and industry gap that's present so uh, you know I, I see a ton of potential uh, to what we spoke to before and all about having the broad spectrum of work uh, that that'll only be successful if we're able to pair it up with the right project guidance and mentorship to to make sure that both both parties are uh, uh, are getting what they desire. Thank you. <clears throat> um, what background, anyone, anyone on the panel, by the way, what background have you had in the past working on these types of projects before? Has anybody ever done this as uh, uh, put together a consortium before and, and um, managed it? I'll start, but uh, I invite my colleagues to jump in. Um, again, the, the Research Foundation in part is a tech transfer organization, but we really view our role more broadly is to try, to try and help foster these partnerships. So we have, uh, I don't want to say we'll be bound by it, but we have learned this a little bit. We uh, I see members here who are uh, part of our water, a National Science Foundation Center we have in water research. So it is a shared membership model where there's shared intellectual property that comes out of it. Uh, that's a model, we were joking earlier, um, when the NSF talked to our industry partners about it, they said, we use a model that's uh, evolved over 20 or 30 years. Uh, nobody likes it, but everybody can tolerate it. Uh, so certainly we're informed by that experience as we, as we come here, in, and that, that would be one example, but we've done, so that's a, an example of a shared IP consortium. We also have done numerous individual projects with companies, as many of you know. So I think there are models that we can build on. So we have funded consortia throughout the state uh, and centers of excellence throughout the state. We don't create them and we don't run them, but we do provide some of the seed funding uh, depending on what the projects will detail. Yeah, so, so at MSO we, we do have the um, rapid prototyping consortium. So it's the 3D printing consortium. I think this is the 27th year. It's a little bit opposite to what uh, Chattel was they are doing. It's one university and um, about currently we have about 47 non-competing companies. And the reason why it's non-compete, it's one of the challenges of trying to, to allow industries to share their pain points without looking back at their shoulders, right? The concern is if my competitor is in, then I'm really concerned in trying to engage um, you know, the university or the center to have things done. Because no matter what consortium we talk about, if industry is not engaged, I mean, at BP they have the, um, the mentors, that's a big key. For us, the fact that the consortium is non-compete, it allows these uh, companies to really engage us and share their pain points. Otherwise, it becomes then, it's pretty difficult for them to keep engaging year over year. Yeah, I, I would echo comments and amplify that it's, it's not a spectator sport. Right, so those, those uh, industry partners that have been most successful in the, the Water Equipment and Policy Center, which we're talking about, are, are those who are actively working with the faculty on the projects. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's just something I would amplify as we can. Just one other question. Um, in doing this for myself, Getting um, a faculty member to commit time and effort and lock that in to a project, is this something you're going to be able to do? I mean, are, are, are we designated uh, faculty members you're going to say, you're part of this program or you contribute 20% of your time? How do you, how do you, how do you build that uh, pay for yourself? I'm not a faculty member. But I respectfully will you know, maybe observe with the Water uh, Equipment and Policy Center. That's our National Science Foundation Center. I want to say it's been around for eight years, if I got that right. It um, has 18 member organizations. We can't tell faculty what to research. But what we can do is give them fertile ground. 
And I think in eight years of member companies bringing forward, here's a set of ideas, selecting projects, having that dialogue, those who want to work in those environments will tend to, tend to gravitate towards it. Now, I also acknowledge that there's a bit of an, is an engineer, an impedance mismatch between universities and sometimes faculty members. Uh, sometimes they think in, in quantum of one semester, one graduate student a year, that kind of thing. And so the, the least significant bit, sometimes for an, a, a research project, can be $50,000 if you want to go a year long for a postdoc. So um, those are some of the challenges that we've worked through before, and the consortium model doesn't eliminate those, but it smooths some of that. And I guess I would invite maybe industry members or people from the, who have seen it from the other side to weigh in on that. Joe? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, Brian, you, you accurately described it. Those, those faculty who wish to engage and, uh, and are motivated by attacking the industry problems will, right? And, and those who are successful come in with the understanding that, uh, that this isn't a, a basic research program, but uh, it's intended to be a, a pre-competitive means to, to solve a problem that could help uh, industry and do, do something that's going to advance, right? So, um, Dean Peters and I were talking offline a little bit before lunch about, you know, how does this balance against uh, faculty's time going for other research grants, right? And, and Brian, again, you, you said it very accurately, we can't tell faculty what to do, uh, but if they wish to engage in industry-sponsored activity, this is a very nice way for them to complement there are other more fundamental research work that they might get funded by groups like NSF or Department of Defense or, or DOE. So. So, let me see if the mic. I, I agree you. Ah. I agree you cannot tell uh, faculty what to do. I'm going to say this before you talk because I don't want to change my mind after you say what you're going to say. So, I don't know what you're going to say, but. Yeah, you cannot, you cannot tell faculty what to do, but this is an ongoing discussion always on how to um, uh, realize the capacity of faculty um, to its fullest extent. How do you get them to um, do more and uh, be more productive in their research and more successful? And I, I think it's not, it's not about telling them what to do. It's more about creating the value and, and, and facilitating and then and, and, and providing the resources and make, because I think faculty want to do more and be successful in uh, what they do. That's why I chose this path. That's why I chose, they chose to go to graduate school and endure all the uh, uh, um, poverty that comes with graduate school. That's, that's what they want to do. Uh, but sometimes it's challenging for them to um, realize their full capacity. And I, I say this, not just only my personal opinion, but from what I notice from visiting other campuses. There are campuses across the state that are not as fortunate with resources as you know, Madison or Milwaukee. But the, the, uh, the, uh, re the intellectual resources that they have is not any less. People can do some of the faculty there, they can do just as well or better than the faculty that they are in Madison or Milwaukee. But we are more fortunate that we come in here with better resources that allows us to accomplish more. So if you provide faculty with the resources, they will be able to do more. We expect faculty to go and find the resources that they need and secure resources that they need. That's difficult. That's, we are not, faculty are not prepared or they, are, they, are, they, are not, they don't have the skill set to go and market sometimes. Some faculty do, but some faculty don't have the skill set to go market their work to industry. Um, and that's where AMM can help faculty by providing fac these faculty with resources that's, that they need to be more productive and also to market them, promote them to industry and say, did you know that Stout just hired the faculty, and this is a true story, coming from Case Western University, finished 
his PhD in molecular chemistry. His work on extruding multi-layer composites and did this great postdoc at University of Minnesota. Just joined Stout last month. I think this could be great person to work with. I want to work with that person. And certainly, I want companies to know that this person just came into Stout. And I will say, you know, it's time for us to engage this person, this faculty, right now, because they came very energetic and they're, 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 they're very excited on uh, launching this new career. So what can we do, not only to help this, uh, this, uh, this faculty, but also to take advantage of the, the, the skills that they have, the expertise. And I don't know if this is the, the, the term to use, take advantage of, but in a good way, to, to benefit from this, this skill set that this faculty is coming from that we may not, if we don't have the structure to, to, to learn about this faculty, we wouldn't know. And um, I, I, have, I can say that, that this faculty probably will have a lot more potential working with companies around maybe Milwaukee than companies around Stout. So how can we plug this faculty with other people to work with companies that they could truly benefit from uh, this, what, what they are bringing in? Thank you. So any other questions? Yeah, oh, sorry, Brad. Okay. <laughs> So I was curious, um, Danny, from WDC's perspective, what are the sort of criteria or, or things you're looking for before you, you know, invest in the center or consortium or other other initiatives? And then after hearing that, I'm curious what you know Joe's looking for from an industry perspective before you know Rexnor is going to write the hundred million dollar check to the center. So from you know, what, what are you? What's kind of on your list that you've got to see before you're willing to make those investments? Top of the list will be industry buy-in, industry commitment to the center. Whether you call it a center of excellence, whether you call it AMM, whatever you choose to call it, we would need to see industry support. We would need to see the academic uh, partners support as well, both from the technical colleges and from the universities. That would be across the UW system, MSOE, Marquette University. Uh, we would like to see the other centers or the other initiatives that WEDC has funded to be incorporated into that as well because it makes it a well-rounded package for us. But the biggest thing will be industry support. Um, we do have criteria for our program that I would need to see met, and Nadal and I have been under uh, conversations on that one uh, quite a bit. And again, that's going to come from the partners that will be partnering with us in this. I, I think the simplest way I could answer the question would be to say, you know, we're, we're looking for uh, a consortia that has a simple operating model that enables us to easily access uh, technical capacity that, that we couldn't get elsewhere, right? And, and I would say the the other thing that, and, and Rex Nord places a high value on this, I, I know I've spoken with several other uh, industry partners in the room who I know place a high value on this as well. This is a talent development activity for us, right? So this is an opportunity for us to get in and strengthen our brand name uh, amongst different universities, get exposure to, to uh, future talent for us, as well as give some of our own engineers uh, exposure and a chance to get in and, uh, and lead a collaborative project in, a, in, albeit, a little bit more safe environment, right? So, uh, uh, you know, that's the sort of structure that we, that we want to see. Uh, for us to invest. Thank you. And uh, anybody wants anybody else wants to add from industry to the same question? What would be the criteria that you would uh, use to decide on whether that you will join? Yes. Uh, What's your measure of the amount oh. of involvement you require? I mean, how many industries? How much involvement from? Uh, There is some flexibility. That's, that is a great question, but there is a lot of flexibility in that. Um, we do have a leverage ratio that we do have to meet, and so depending on what the end projects or products are going to be and what 
the partners all decide that they want to pursue will help guide a lot of that information. So this is this is really a collaborative effort with the partners that I will be uh, conducting with them to find out what, what does that exactly mean. It is a great question. I wish I had a much more concrete answer for you, but uh, our program is really meant to uh, assist industry in alleviating pressure points or to reach goals that they want to attain. And so we have a bit of flexibility on how we go about doing that. In other words, for the uh, short-term uh, expectation and the long-term expectation, like uh, one year, that's a short-term, and uh, two years, that's a long-term. So what's the expectation from the industry through the project? It, it's a good question, Junji, and I, I would say it, it, it all depends on the project, right? And, and there, uh, I believe, uh, and again, Dean Peters and I were speaking about this before lunch, uh, we saw in, in Chitel's talk this morning, the figure he showed where there's, there's a broad spectrum of work that goes on at, at BP. You know, there's this zero to two year bucket of work, five to 10%, uh, the two to 10 year work, 75 to 80%, and the, the 10 plus year work, uh, five to 10% or 10 to 20%. I think I got those numbers approximately accurate. Uh, so so there's, there's going to be expectation for some of the, uh, we need to get this stuff done, it's a business priority, and this is not going to be pre-competitive research uh, that we'd like to see a deliverable from in zero to two years, right? Uh, it, it'd be outstanding if for the, the primary industry players who are involved, if we can agree on what are a handful of common technical themes that can seed and inform research programs that could extend more on the, the two to five year time frame uh, or longer perhaps. So, we're, so we're, uh, we're informing, again, what are the broader themes that you and your peer group can be working on to address, again, broader industry problems related to materials and manufacturing, right? So there's, there's got to be a balance of that plus the, we have a business need, we have a technical problem we need to solve, and we need hand solving it, near term stuff. So I have a question to Danny. Um, so um, Brett asked you about the uh, criteria that you use to de decide to fund the center of excellence. Or my question is following that: What criteria do you use to assess the success of um, a project like this, a center of excellence? Or currently, what criteria do you use to assess the success of the similar? centers that you have funded? First and foremost, sustainability over the long term. So that is something that we look at in an application from the get-go, is do we see that there will, will be viability of that investment that the state taxpayers have made for the long term. Uh, beyond that, it really is going to be based upon, you know, what are the criteria, what are the, the metrics that we have agreed on as a project to see fulfilled? And then what is that benefit for the state as a whole and the industry that we are uh, responding to? Uh, with a center like this, there are a lot of industry players in different industry sectors that can benefit from the center. So we will likely be taking it from the, from the get-go, we'll be looking at it very carefully as to what, what thrust areas we'll be focused on first, then we'll be identifying what are those metrics that we want to measure. Uh, there's going to be a lot of flexibility with that. But you're, you're, the first one is just sustainability. I, I need to see sustainability uh, for a center, and that will be you know, 5, 10, 15 years out. Thank you. Can I just say that to underscore the drama of this panel, we've arranged full orchestration, you may have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sundar, yes. Uh, so obviously, I think, I think everybody in this room wants this option and want this to succeed, right? So one of the reasons I'm here is I actually, to get to the brass tacks, the real world. I actually put it on a slide for strategy in September. We do strategy in September and the annual operating plan in January. So I did put enhanced industry university partnerships to drive innovation. Right? So I got a driving through the plan in January. What is what is a differentiating so I go to the board and I pitch it in January. So what is a differentiating feature of this that 
I can propose, or at least sow a seed, to say that, hey, we need to more actively, more actively engage in this. That makes sense. To, to drive home and build that momentum. I'm going to start. It's not a single differentiating feature, but I, I want to key in on something Joe mentioned, which was talent. And we've talked today about some major areas. Um, pool research is one major advantage. A second is talent. A third is the network, getting to know, you know, interacting with colleagues and peers and, and people at other companies. And the fourth is the facilities and capabilities, um, materials, labs, things like that. And it's, it reminded me of a case study I did on Southwest Airlines in business school. And the, the thing about Southwest Airlines was they had the same kind of planes, they flew with fast gate changes, unassigned seats, and they, all the elements of their strategy had to work together. And I think in the same way that you don't exactly know how, but all four of those pieces are going to complement each other in a center. So the talent, the research, the networking that you do with colleagues, as well as the university and, and their students who will hopefully become your colleagues and the facilities. So, um, one element I would add is that all the pieces have got to work together, and, and I think I hope you're selling all those. I don't know which one may be most compelling to your management. Scott, yeah. oh, anybody wants to I, add? I, I would say it's the, the strength in numbers. Um, you know, I you know being in the additive manufacturing field for a long time, um, the challenge you hear from folks from Wisconsin is always we're the best kept secret, right? And it's a bad thing sometimes. <laughs> you, wanna, you want people to know about what you do. I think, um, just like Doug said, um, you know, they have 11, I think, institutions um, you know, participating. This provides an opportunity for more exposure. I mean, we do have partners that we work with. This presents another opportunity to provide sort of a comprehensive package with them. We all have a, a contact within our own industries. So now being able to bring those back here to provide more opportunities for them to share their pain points. Because at the end of the day, you know, I mean, again, coming from a university, we don't want to drive the issues. We want industry to share what their challenges are, because that's where the payback comes from. Um, Scott, you have a question? So I got a general question, you know, and I've been lucky, I guess, to sit through a number of different meetings. You know, and I, I'm comfortable that there's a net need and a comfortable industry can communicate what that would be, and, you know, we can find a way to fund it, and we have the expertise amongst the university. Um, but to me, it's a little bit like a business. You know, if you let the technical and academics run the business, then the business dies because it gets so granularly focused and what they're doing that they don't talk about how does it sustain. So, you know, I'll use the example, you've got a wonderful thing going with, and hopefully I don't mess up the acronym, but RM2N, but the first time I heard about it was sitting on the advisory board and it's been in existence four years and I haven't been seen. So what's the thought of the group as to how does this get advertised, how does it get managed, how does it get promoted, how does it get communicated, my experience is that, you know, we had this discussion at the table that, you know, the technical people sometimes want to stay technical and then some of them cross the business. Even though it's not for profit, it's, it's a bit of a business. How's the business going to run? How's that going to be set up? How's it going to be advertised? How are you going to handle turnover? How are you going to handle wins and losses? Please. So there are there are a lot of details to be worked out as far as how is it going to run, how is turnover going to be handled, and so forth. And that really is up to uh, the team to make that determination and the advisory board to assist them in doing so. Uh, with regard to the the. It's a good question. It's a very complex question. But um, the marketing part of it, somebody had mentioned, you know, how can WEDC or other state entities help to market it? Um, that is something that probably with the RM2N, there was something that could have been done a little bit better. We were uh, one of the funders for the RM2N. So the goal with the, the AMM is that we would make sure through all of our channels that it is heard about, understood, and to help get that word out, especially with something that is as broad and with the depth that this will have. So we're hoping that we can take, help take a, a lead role in, in doing that to get that word out. But then a lot of it too is just the word of mouth from the industry partners. It's the word of mouth from the academic partners. It's to have the AMM itself 
be their own voice to move forward to say, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we can partner. Play a little bit of devil's advocate, though, you know, I'll speak for Modine. We do our internal testing and then we do testing as an outside service. We're really good at doing the internal testing, communicating with our divisions. Our outside testing service ebbs and flows because we kind of took a word of mouth expertise piece. I mean, I, I don't play devil's advocate. I don't think that's enough. I think it's got to be run a bit like a business. It's kind of what I'm looking for, and there's got to be a lead to it that's that's responsible for that and the membership and the turnover and the recruitment and you know pounding the pavement and having the discussions. I mean, Nadal's doing a great job of that right now as he talks with everybody. But what happens after it's formed? I guess I would just observe, um, Dean Peters, I'm recalling prior to the IUCRC launching here, that's the Water Equipment Policy Center, we visited NC State around that time and visited a couple centers there where in each of those centers they had typically an academic lead and a business lead. And I don't, you know, if, if resources will support that, that seems to be a pretty strong model. And in the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center, for example, we have a, a strong academic lead. Dr. Avdi is the associate mechanical engineering professor's associate or director of innovation. And I'm that business guy because I'm not an academic. So, you know, it's a powerful model if we can afford it, but it does at least help answer the sustainability and the run it like a business question. But the other challenge, which of course is um, you guys get, is how, how to get your attention. That's a harder one because you have a lot of demands on your attention. I would agree with you. It's, it needs to be run like a company or a business. Um, the RM2N, I think part of its uh, failure in getting the word out is everything's sort of done um, goodwill ad hoc. There's no actual funding for it. So we're just doing it, you know, by committed people. And I think we're still going to need that, people committed to doing this. Um, so most of what we've done is sort of travel to um, manufacturing shows and things like that, have booths and things like that. And so you hit a small number of uh, companies, but, you know, not enough. And so I think, you know, having that funding, hopefully through WEDC to get started here for the marketing, is critical because it, it, it's getting the word out because there's great resources in this. I'm steering the pitch a little bit. You got a wonderful business school I'm a graduate of. That I think you got some pretty good talent within the university to do that. I just think absent we'll go off of the bank, we'll get a membership, and then if it's not successful right away, it'll, it'll you know, go off in a hurry. You know, the word of mouth on MSLP, that works. We've been around 27 years. So a lot of the industry knows about it, and even as they come in and out, they know it's established and it's there. So, uh, and, and Nadal might roll his eyes at me for this, but we can certainly incorporate into an application a communications plan um, that we would then look at very carefully. And that, again, would need to be the partners for the AMM coming together to identify what that would be, how that will work, who is responsible for it. Um, that is definitely part of an application is, is how that could be communicated, but um, I don't know if it's within the, the full app, but we can certainly add that as a component of it. So once again, I mean, the funding through us is really about what industry needs, and you've clearly identified as, as a need for a center like this, so we'll be looking at that very carefully. You just raised the bar on the doll's application. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, th this is a great question, Scott, like because <laughs> you actually raised a, few, a couple of really good points. Um, so first, with the um, business model and how we're going to handle the business aspect of the center, the model that ICAM has, which is associate director or two associate directors, one from the academic side and one from BP, which is the, the industry side. I think this, this is great. We can ask Chetel how is this working for them. But I think having this, this uh, leadership that comes, that combines both the industry and the academic side, this is essential. So that's, that's one side. The other side is a lot of industry people that we are expecting to be partners and there's not members in the center, but strategic partners. We also rely on their expertise. They are running a business. So I'm gonna put Joe again on the spot, and Joe told us last night he's planning to finish his MBA this semester, you said, or this year? Something like that. Okay, Joe, you have a PhD in material science, you have an MBA, you're running. Help us. You're a, if, you be, if Rexner becomes a partner, 
we expect of our partners to help us also in not only the technical side, but the business side. So the business aspect, you have to look at the three partners. There is the state, university, and industry. And we're not going to burden universities with the entire load. Industry needs to tell us what's a good business model. And the state, certainly, we don't need even to ask them. They will require a good business model for the, they want to see a good business model for this center to work. That, so that's for the first part. Uh, the second one, the RM2N. I think this is a great point. You, you just um, made a case for why AMM is needed to WDC. There are resources already in place, RM2N. They have been in place for years. We're part of it. Industry don't know about it. Dog addressed that and said, we just don't have the resources. So what do we need to make such an existing resource? It's already in place to realize its higher potential to make Modin aware of it and benefit from RM2N. They need resources. That's what we can do. We can work on, and this is when we uh, reached out to uh, Doug um, at Eau Claire, and we, every place we, we visited, we wanted to may have a value proposition in place. What can we do for RM2N? We can't say we want to incorporate RM2N in AMM because it will help our case. That's a really bad value proposition to make. But instead, <coughs> we offered RM2N, how can we work together where you can provide the services, that's, a, that's, that's what you do, but AMM will help you with the resources. So we can help you get more exposure, we can help you with marketing, we can even help, help you with grow with the resources and facilities as part of AMM. So it's a mutual benefit. It's truly a, a, a partnership. We don't want to take any um, uh, 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 credit or, or to um, uh, use anything that rm 2 worked hard on building just for our benefit. It's more of, and we, even when we reach out to other institutions, we tell them, we don't want you to change your strengths and mission. We don't want Stout to change what they are doing. We want to build on that. You have this uh, Discovery Center at Stout. How can we make Discovery Center part of this larger umbrella where we can have Discovery Center have a, a much further reach than what they are currently doing at around, around uh, uh, Menominee? So um, that, this, this are really um, two important points that fit in at the core of why we need, uh, or uh, one of them, why we need AML and the other one, how we're going to do that. Um, I see, Joe, you wanted to add something? No? No. I okay. Can I just make a point on, on communication is critical. And you really should have a professional comms manager as part of your bid. We, we're small, we have one. And his role is not just to communicate outside. You saw the videos today done by Alex Chilton. They go also internally to the business as well. So you've got to be able to communicate the success in what you're doing in a really clear way back into the businesses. So I would say if you haven't got a communications manager in your flat, you ought to write one in there. Okay, any other questions? I have my still 25 questions if you don't have questions. Yes. I have a question. Um, um, again, my company is Mono of Engines. We developed a small internal combustion engine to run a natural gas. Something for the gas companies, by the way. Um, I went to Madison and talked to them about taking a look at the engine to give me an analysis of it. I should have come to MSOE, by the way. I know. You can't see I know. <laughs> I, I will, by the way. Um, and I went there and I sat down and talked to some people. It would take, um, first I'd have to supply, you know, give them the information what I wanted. It would take about three months for acceptance, and then they'd have to ran it down for another six months. About a year later, I'd get the analysis. I went to Southwest Research, and in six weeks I had my analysis done. Timing is critical to small businesses. As you can tell, I couldn't go to Madison, which I'd love to have done. 
Um, how do we know? <coughs> this is just a computer analysis of the engine to make sure that, you know, uh, and the computer people can tell you right away if it's going to work or not work itself. Um, also, it's about half as expensive in South Atlantic as it was in Mr. Madison. So, how do we look at um, profiling your company to be able to look at timing and cost as compared to other <coughs> companies out there that are doing this kind of work today? <coughs> I mentioned the impedance mismatch. Yep. I think if you need it in six weeks, it's probably not best done in the center. <laughs> and, well, so you, okay, so you're saying you're going to have a certain um, type but, of probe and you're going to go out. I, yeah, I mean, I don't want to discount that. I mean, it may be that we get to volume where there's enough of a, you know, there's enough pool <laughs> need that we can keep a resource. But in general, if you're starting from cold, the professor's kind of working that quantum of I can put a graduate student on it. So I think if you need it in six weeks, you're probably better off getting it done somewhere else, at least in the near term. Now, that may not be true for some of the analytical services. But for that kind of thing, um, you know, there, there's going to be projects that, are fit, that fit in the center in, in the shared pooled research and some that don't. Exactly. It depends on the project. We have um, some local companies that bring in things. They call us in the morning and say, we got an issue. And we can actually have data by that afternoon. But that's because we have, at, at UW Eau Claire, we have two staff that can do that. Um, oftentimes, it's not the same day. It's, but within a couple of days. But it really does depend on the project, something like that. Um, we'd have to find the expertise outside to do something like that. But if it's simple, simple um, materials analysis, that often we can do in a few days. But I guess the question lands up, what is the scope of your business to go after, whether I would want to come to you or not? In other words, of course, this project probably wouldn't work. But what, what is that scope of business that you're going to bring customers in with and say, you know, I like but before what you said was, um, we've already cataloged all the equipment and, and things that are there. That's nice to have because now I can look and see, hey, I can use this X-ray machine or I can use the infrared uh, machine um, and I can target that with, with your business. That's the kind of, that you mentioned before, how do you sell yourself and where do you sell yourself under what scope of business you want to work under? And I, I guess I'm missing that because I see a, a big area you'd like to work under but it's, it's, it's probably a little bit too large yet to, uh, to manage. Yeah, you know, I think the goal is to sort of cover everything in the sense that, you know, the arm 2 n can sort of cover those um, testing things that need to be done quickly. Um, and so, you know, if we can't do it, for example, we've had another company we've done work with that uh, needed something we don't do. And I send out, I, we have a, because we're a network, I have contacts at the other um, 11 campuses, send out the email saying, hey, anybody, can anybody help with this? And then I get a response, uh, in this case it was about two hours later, and so then I give the company the contact information and they know how to contact now. See, that I like. I, you're the one-stop shop, if you will. Right. I come to right. you and say, can you handle this project for me? Right. And you say, yes, we can or no, we can't. So that's so, the stuff if, if I could add to this in a broader sense, so this is at the, for the testing and analysis, and probably this is the, the qualifying of a project of what it needs to be done. But then you can take it to the higher level, which is having the contractual research, where if, uh, if the testing and the analysis is done fast, um, relatively cheap, low cost, with the RM10, RM2N level, at least you know what the problem is, and then you can choose to decide if you want to go to another level, which is having uh, look at it at a, at a more uh, research-type uh, uh, project. And then you, 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 this will be a longer term, but at least you have your answers that you're looking for right away and quickly. The problem is when you, you mentioned when you go to a research institution with a problem that may end up becoming not only a contractual research uh, 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 a type of, of problem, it could end up becoming a pre-competitive research. Maybe it's a common event. It, it might be considered as a common problem in industry that several companies want to solve this problem. But then when you go with, with, a, with a simple problem that you have a failure in a, in a product that you say a failure and you want to know what is causing this failure, um, it's, it's too small for some large you know, centers to look at it right away, to say, okay, we will look at this right away and find out what caused this problem. I think it's, it's where you take, when you said that you, you took it to different institutions and then you found a, a, an organization that was able to give you the results in two, because maybe you did not, to start with, you did not go to the right place 
for this particular problem. There are we, we, some institutions are just there. They're, they're, uh, they're busy with these larger projects. So I think what's unique about AMM will be is that we will have this broad spectrum where we can start with um, an analysis, that's lab analysis at RM2N, fairly quick. Then we decide, go back to the company and say, this is what we think the problem is. Do you want us to take it to the next level? Yeah. The, in working with self Press Research, so the interesting point he's bringing up is that you, know, you can get into a consortium when we've been there with Southwest on a concept around internal combustion engines, diesel emissions is the one that we belong to. Then as it started to get refined to more of a contracted research, there would be a couple, you know, of the OEs that would go off and say, look, we're going to go and do this project together. So maybe a Caterpillar and a Bosch, you know, do an injection and engine. And then you could also just hire, you know, specific contract work like you're talking about down there. I think we talked a little bit about that in the advisory board, that that would be some of the concepts as you go through. I think the one difference maybe I heard today between Southwest and, um, maybe how the consortium would, would work is that if you have the money, Southwest will do the work. Um, that may be the one thing we just need to talk about as a nuance is that if you have too many requests come in and, and the research groups say, yeah, but we're not really interested in that, then they may, you know, pattern to these other things. We just need to talk about that. I think that's part of your question. So we're getting uh, close to the um, end of uh, our scheduled program, but before we end the program, I want to ask if you have any other questions to the panelists. Some of them will be available during the social hour. They might not be completely sober, so if you want to ask them questions, you might want to ask them the questions now. Or maybe some questions are left better for later. I don't know. You make that call. Um, any other questions? No questions? So um, I want to thank you all for sticking, for, first for joining us today and for sticking around. Uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, one thing I mentioned earlier that if I know that each one of you is going to leave today feeling they got your money and time worth, money being paying $12 for parking or 15, I don't know how much you paid, and taking eight or 10 hours off your work, if you got the, the, that time and money worth of being here today, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm happy that you're just leaving and not saying we just wasted this. Of course, we have somebody who took, uh, I don't know, 15,000 miles trip It's going to be back and forth uh, here. So I, I, I don't know how much you have to do to make it worth your time. But for everybody else, I hope you got your uh, time and money worth for it. And I want to thank you very much. And before you leave, I want to thank the person who facilitated everything here. I think my, my opinion is, is everything worked wonderful today. And that is Wendy Pearl sitting there. So thank you very much. <laughs>